our classroom. My name is Lindsay Anderson, and I'm so happy to spend the afternoon with you guys. Um, or maybe it's the morning, or maybe it's the afternoon or the evening, depends on where in the world you are. I am here in Washington, DC, which is home to the National Geographic Society, um, and it's where we're headquartered. This is not our headquarters, this is my own personal headquarters, um, but as it is, welcome to Explore Classroom. For those of you who might be new to Explore Classroom, a little bit about what we do. Uh, at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. And the heart of our community is our explorers. These are world-class scientists and cutting edge researchers and conservationists. They are transformative educators and of course, powerful storytellers. So Explorer Classroom connects students with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&A. Um, and right now, while we're all exploring from indoors, National Geographic is providing Explorer Classroom sessions every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, so if you'd like, you can join us back here tomorrow or Friday or even next week. You can find a full schedule online. Um, and we have lots of great Explorers for you all to meet. So. Today, we are very lucky to be connecting with Asha Stewart. She's a documentary photographer and filmmaker, and she tells the stories of underreported and marginalized communities. Her work has taken her all around the world. Uh, but before we dive into some of the stories and subjects that she works on, I want to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by several different student groups. Um, and we also have hundreds and hundreds of people joining us live on YouTube. So, it's great to see everyone and welcome you all here. Um, I'm gonna give a little shout out to, to states and countries that we know are joining us. So uh, I wish I was a little bit closer to that map, but I'm far away, so buckle up. Um, we have students from Alabama, California, Colorado, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, my home state, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, South Dakota, Virginia, Washington, Washington, DC, Wisconsin, and Wyoming. And we're also joined by some international viewers from Belgium, Canada, Ecuador, India, Israel, Mexico, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, and the United Kingdom. So that's a lot. Um, and we're happy that you are all here, no matter what time of day it is for you, because I know that is a lot of time zones. All right, there's a couple of special groups that I wanna give shout outs to. They are Fourth Grade AIM, Adkins Family, Amir, Cloverdale Catholic, Duncan Chapel Elementary, L, the Foy Boys, the Gaylor Family, Hazel in Portland, Grandma Pakes, JP, Jack and Jacob, Memorial Middle School, Middle excuse, blah, blah, Miller South School, Mission Control, Riley, Sean Lim in Korea, the Warner Family, Vision Photo Camp, and World Science Scholars. So, so many new faces out there today, and that was a lot. If I missed you, um, I'm sorry. Please say hi to us in the chat bar so that we know that you're here. Um, but that is plenty for me. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Asha, Asha, so she can tell us a little bit about her work. Asha, go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Can you hear me? Asha, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So I'm Asha Stewart. I'm a documentary photographer and filmmaker. I travel across the world documenting different communities and cultures. So here's a picture of me in Africa working with the Sukuma tribe. A lot of the work that I do is centered around portraiture photography. 
I love to tell stories about, you know, people from faraway places who have different cultures and communities that anyone anywhere in the world can connect with. My work has taken me to countries like Haiti, where I've been able to document um, different communities in that country, to places in Alabama. I love telling stories about people because I feel like there's always a way to learn about different people, whether they have different languages or different food or different cultures. I think that through photography and filmmaking, there's so many, dif so many different ways that people can connect through the visual elements. So for my recent project, I went to the country of Bangladesh. And in Bangladesh right now, they are dealing with sea level rise. So in the town of Chittagong that I went to, every single day, the city of Chittagong, 70% of the city goes underwater. And NASA predicts in the next 100 years that this city will be completely underwater and the people living in it will, living in it will have to move. So here's a picture of me with my camera in my hand and the guy right next to me is my fixer. So he helps me navigate throughout the country to make sure that I get the pictures that I need and to make sure that I'm accurately portraying the country that I am in. And so here we are on a street in Bangladesh um, as we're working on the story. And so as you guys are all students, I think it's important for you to learn about how students are over in countries like Bangladesh as well. In the city of Chittagong, they are also impacted by sea level rise as well. Every day um, they deal with water entering the schools and they are forced to still learn, you know, sometimes when the water enters. And I wanna show you guys a quick video clip so you can see um, what their reality is. A city that receives thousands of climate migrants every year in itself is struggling with its battle against sea level rise. Every day during high tide, water from the Bay of Bengal flows into the city streets, causing 70% of the city to go underwater. The daily high tide makes daily life an inconvenience for ordinary souls living in Chittagong. Water enters into the homes of residents who can't afford to adapt, but are forced to adjust the best way they can. Schools are impacted as well. Teachers have to adapt and keep their students focused while giving lesson plans as the water enters. Many students wear sandals in hopes of not getting their shoes ruined. Escaping the water completely is inevitable. Thus, students have to frequently wash their uniforms out from the unsanitary water. NASA predicts the city of Chittagong could be completely underwater in the next 100 years. Within a decade, more than 10 million people could be impacted by climate migration in Bangladesh. The future and destiny of Bangladesh lies in the delicate balance of protecting our planet and the precious people living in it. Great. So that was in Bangladesh where, you know, every day these students and these teachers have to struggle with sea level rise. It's not something that is going to happen in 20 years or 50 years. It's happening right now today and it impacts students just like you across the world. So for my next project that I did with National Geographic was called The Lost Tribe of Africa. Now at first glance, this young boy looks like he could be from a village in Africa, but he's actually from the Sidi tribe in Southern India. 500 years ago, slaves were brought from East Africa to the Southern shores of India. And over the course of you know, years, this community has been able to maintain a dynamic culture and community. 
Right now in India, across India, there are about 70,000 CD people that live in uh, different states across um, India. The CD people are very dynamic. They've been able to create this East African Bantu um, culture that's still thriving today. And of course, uh, the backbone of the community is the youth. In the CD tribe, they make sure that the youth are able to maintain their cultural heritage through cultural programs. So as you can see in these images, these are some of the CD youth um, posing for portraits after their dance class. A lot of the CDs are a part of, you know, this cultural program where they go across the country doing um, African Indian fusion arts and cultural uh, performances. And so this, this community is very dynamic. They've, they have their own unique um, African Indian fusion of food, uh, of languages, a lot of it originating from the Bantu culture. And so I wanna show you guys a clip so you can see the cool dance moves that they do to preserve their culture. Chegatinale, Genaro, your Genaro, and the Kinta Kadime in the Wavishidana. You hate at the car and the TV, it was the year. Nanan, Rathri, Nitin, the Echerishi, part of the day. Nanabo Adikara near the Mukawa to two and the non voice ten. Adarenda, our in the Wagyu, Yaru and Nadu, Lubikolita. That's the end of uh, my slideshow. Great. Well, thank you. Um, there's lots to lots to think about there. Um, we're going to start taking questions from both the on-screen participants and um, if you're streaming along, um, please put your questions in the YouTube chat bar, uh, just one at a time, and we'll we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, I think one question that popped up several times already, Asha, which I'll start with, um, when you were talking about the flooding in Bangladesh and, and the school, yeah. um, let's see, Maureen, Dana, and Jennifer all asked, is there something that we could do to help that situation? I think that... Oh no, did we lose you? Uh-oh. Asha, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? I can now. I think you froze. Uh, yeah. I was like, oh, I see froze. Okay. Um, yeah, there's several ways that you can get involved. Um, there's organizations like National Geographic Society that does a great job of raising awareness on climate change and sea level rise around the world. Um, if you want to, you can join a campaign, you could start your own campaign, 
Um, you can educate the people around you. Um, and you can also pick up a camera and start documenting in your own community how the environment is changing. Awesome. Great place to start. All right, so um, let's start with uh, Tiger and August. If you guys, do you guys have a question? Go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask away. Um, so in the uh, CD tribe, uh, what are some of the traditions like that like sort of merge yeah S merge the african and the indian culture well every year they have this bakra festival where it's like you know hundreds of thousands well it's not hundreds of thousands, thousands of cd people kind of come together and they do um this musical program where they're doing a lot of african uh, drum rhythms and a lot of african music they're speaking in this like East African language that's blended into Hindi language. Um, so they still practice that um, tradition, definitely, um, with their Bakara festival that happens every year in the South. Thanks, guys. All right, next up, um, Rasheen and Ronika, do you guys have a question? Go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. Um, why do the sea levels rise in ba Bangladesh? And also, is it just that one city or is it all of Bangladesh? Yeah, so it's, it's all of Bangladesh for the most part, like with the, co uh, the coastal areas. So the city of Chittagong is actually um, on the coastal area. So it's a coastal city. And so a lot of times what you'll see is that in Bangladesh, they have a lot of little islands that consist of the country. And a lot of times the people on the island will have to move to the city. But if they move to the city, they're still facing that same type of um, issue. And one of the things that's happening with sea level rise is um, some of the glaciers that are melting. It's causing, uh, when the ice goes into the ocean, it starts to rise. And so countries across the world are having problems when it comes to being able to adapt fast enough because people said at first that, you know, this would take a hundred years for, for this to happen. It would not happen in my lifetime. It wouldn't happen in your lifetime, but now we're seeing that it's already happening. And so now we all have to work together and we have to try and figure out ways that we can contribute to raising awareness about this. Thank you. Okay, one um, question coming from, from YouTube from Natasha that I think we all have is, how did you become a photographer, Natasha? How did I become a photographer? Well, it happened by accident, actually. I was in school to study cultural anthropology, which is the study of humankind. In a sense, it's a degree in people watching. I just would, you know, observe, you know, different cultures. I would observe how they interact, how they base their ideas. And I thought the best way for me to communicate with the world is through a visual form. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I don't really like writing papers all the time. I really don't. And in the anthropology field, that's what you would be doing. But I decided that I was gonna pick up a camera and that was gonna be the way that I communicate what it is that I saw. And so that, is kind of how I got into it was when I was in college and studying anthropology. Awesome. I think an interesting follow-up from that, that also comes from the YouTube chat bar. Um, Daniel asked, how difficult is it to gain the trust of the people you photograph so you can capture their real life as opposed to a presented life? Yeah, I think that as long as you walk into a community with respect, then they typically respect you back. I walk in with more questions than you know answers about what's happening there. I ask a lot of questions and I think that I'm very curious about their community and they're very curious about me. And so through that curiosity, um, they open their arms and they're, they're very willing to um, let me into their world because I'm coming at it in an authentic way. 
Okay, thank you. All right, coming back to our on screen participants. Um, let's start with Sharia. Can you um, unmute your mic and ask a question? Um, how many different countries have you been to to do photography? I've been to over 12 countries to do photography. Last year alone, I went to Bangladesh, I went to Namibia, and I went to Barbados to do, no, I didn't go to Barbados. I went, I went to Namibia and I went to um, Bangladesh last year. So those two, but in the past I've worked in Vietnam, Thailand, India, Haiti, um, Mexico, Peru, and a bunch of other countries. It's really, I'm very fortunate to be able to leave my community to go across the world to go photograph. But I think that it's always important for me to go and to learn about different communities and different cultures. But it's so important to come back to Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm from, and be able to take the knowledge that I learned abroad and be able to apply that and to document my own community here as well. So I'm very proud to be able to work here at home too. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, Danithi, do you wanna go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Um, so, like, what type of discriminations do the CD tribe face, like in India and stuff? Yeah, so the CD tribe, they are considered to be untouchables. So in the Hindu caste system, they are at the bottom. Um, so they are discriminated against quite a bit from a social and religious aspect, but then also from an ethnic aspect because being a tribal community, tribal people in India typically face a lot of discriminations because people don't think that they're as good as other people because you know they live out in the woods, they have you know a dynamic culture where they paint themselves and put beautiful leaves. I think people um, sometimes don't see them as acceptable people. But I think through their cultural practices, they've been able to instill resilience and confidence in their community. And so they're just gonna keep going and keep growing and being who they are. Okay, all right. Next up, um, Alex, do you wanna go ahead and unmute your mic and ask a question? Um, I was wondering, is every time you go to make a video, are you always welcomed with open arms or have there been hostilities or like incidents? That's a good question. Um, no, surprisingly, um, most people are really kind. You know, if you go into a community uh, with good intentions and you're willing to work with them, you know, when I go into a community, I'm not going to just, this is exactly what I'm going to do. I know, you know, what this is, this is, this is. I go in and it's more of like a collaborative process. So I ask questions about, you know, who they are as people. Um, and I try to give respect to that. And I let the time take its place because some, some like with some of the work that I just showed you, it would be hard to in one day go to a community and then have them trust me with their story. Sometimes it takes, you know, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, but I usually wait and make sure that I'm at that level of respect for them. Thanks for the good question, Alex. Um, okay, two questions I think are an interesting pair from the chat bar. So um, go play outside asked what equipment do you use to get the videos and images? Mm -hmm. uh, and then Blue Seal Recordings asked, what teams do you work with or do you work solo? So some questions about your process and your equipment. Yeah, so uh, that's a little question. So I, with my filmmaking, when I'm filming something, I typically will use a couple different cameras. Sometimes I use Sony, sometimes I use Blackmagic. I'll have maybe one or two film cameras. And when I'm doing still photography, I like to use Fujifilm cameras for photojournalism style stuff and documentary photography and portrait photography. Um, when I go, it depends on the budget and it depends on the scale of the project. With the two videos that I showed you guys, I actually shot all of that myself. 
And I will tell you, especially to all the young women here who are on here, it's awesome to go out and shoot because, you know, the word cameraman is typically people thinking that it's a man that's doing that, but it doesn't have to be. And you can pick up a camera and you can go out and shoot in your own community or you can go across the world as well. So, um, yeah, I typically shoot a lot of my work by myself. Um, Oop, lost my mouse there for a minute. <laughs> um, okay, next up from the chat bar, Jeff asks, what story have you investigated that's had the greatest impact on you? I think it would be the Sidi tribe in India. I think because of the way that they've been able to maintain their culture and be able to rise above racism and discrimination has really resonated with me, especially being African American and understanding the history in America and understanding the social issues that still happen today. I think uh, for me, it was a special moment to go across to India and to be able to work with the community and to see you know their programs and how they live and then also one of the things that happened from the documentary was being able to help the cd people raise funds for to build a community center so that they could have a place where they meet and have a place where they can discuss how to best um, make social programs available in their community so filmmaking and photography has a a role which can help to raise awareness about certain issues. And if you're able to, you know, visually convey that, you can really create change anywhere in the world. Okay. All right, we're gonna loop back through our on-screen participants. We'll start with you, Augustin Tiger, if you have a question. Go ahead and unmute. Uh, uh, how does the, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. All right, so then next we'll go to Rasheen and Ronica. Do you guys have a question? Uh, yes. Um, why do the CD people paint their faces? When they dance. Mm -hmm. So that's just part of their cultural program. I think that for the kids, it's a way of empowering them. It's like a costume. So they feel like, you know, when they can get up and perform, they feel like they're part of this, you know, cultural, like historical dance routine. And I think that it's just, it's just part of their costume. Thank you. Um, one question that's come up several times in the, the chat bar is, are there any CD people in Africa still? And if so, where? Yeah, it's on the whole continent. <laughs> um, so the CD people are descendants of African slaves. So on the island of Zanzibar in Tanzania, which is like East Africa, they were captured and sold to the British, Portuguese, and Dutch as slaves. And on the slave ship, they went all the way to South India and they got off on the ship and they were enslaved for hundreds of years until they ran away into the forest and created their own community. So the CD people are really African people of African descent who migrate, well, were stolen and forcibly taken to, uh, to India. So they're African people. Okay. Um, all right. Next up, let's go to Denithi. Do you have a question? Go ahead and unmute. Um, so out of the countries that you've been to so far, which one um, like, um, like made an impression on you the most? Of course, India. India is awesome. There's so many people, so many different cultures. It's so beautiful. You can find, you know, heaven on earth. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. 
And I think that there's so many different types of communities in India that you will never get bored. It's just like, there's always something new. There's always, you know, different foods to try, different teas to have, uh, people are very friendly. Um, I've met some of the nicest people in the world in India. So I love India, definitely. And such delicious food. I know, right? But speaking of new things, um, Anne asked in the chat bar, do you choose your own assignments or are they given to you? Or is it a mix? Yeah, it's a mix of both. Uh, yesterday I was in Athens, Georgia, photographing for Politico magazine on the coronavirus, trying to understand how people in rural Georgia are preparing for the virus. Um, so I was there doing that and that was an assignment. But after all of this ends and we're all out of our quarantine quarters and back into the world, I'll be doing a project for National Geographic on a, a community in Alabama called it's a, they live in a community called Africa Town. So I'll be down there working with them. And so that was through National Geographic Society with an, a grant for me to be an explorer. Okay. Um, another sort of related question to, to what you were just speaking about. Um, Maureen asked on uh, YouTube, now that COVID-19 is here, how do you still take pictures in different places and or, or not, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's always tricky because health and safety is number one. You don't wanna put yourself in a situation where you might contribute and you might get the virus or you might give it to someone else. Um, so I think that that's always tricky. Yesterday when I was out uh, photographing, I was making sure that I was doing social distancing. I was making sure that I had a mask on, um, that I wasn't in a place for too long, but um, I went out and I, took some photographs for Politico magazine on how people are just preparing. And I think that, you know, it just, it just depends on where you're going. Like the, if this was rural Georgia where there aren't too many cases, but if it was in New York city, then it, it might be a different way that I would go about it. I don't know. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, um, let's go to Sharia. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and unmute, please. What was your first documentary and where did you take it? Mm -hmm. So the first documentary I ever did was in the teeny island called Haiti in the Caribbean. I did a project looking at, uh, I worked with the US Embassy of Haiti and it was more so like a series of short documentaries that I did on Haitian culture and looking at how um, different social in issues impact different uh, people in the country, whether it be um, diseases actually, poverty, hunger, and then I also looked at their dynamic culture as well. So I went to the tiny, tiny nation of uh, Haiti. Okay. Um, Alex, do you have a, another question? Go ahead and unmute. I was wondering if like slavery has had an influence on like the culture of the city people. Like, is it part of, have, do they feel like resentment or is it like part of their culture? Like, has it like impacted their way of life? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I can tell you how I, I met the city people and answer your question. So I actually studied abroad in India in 2012, and I was there for about six months. And the awesome thing about studying abroad in India and the beautiful thing about India is that they have so many different festivals and celebrations, which means you get out of school quite a bit um, because of those. So one day I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go to the Arabian Sea. So I got on a bus and I went and I, on that bus trip, we had to stop and get more gas. And I got off the bus when we got when we got to the gas station, I started wandering around and I bumped into a man who had an Afro. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, this guy has an Afro in India? Like, this does not make sense to me. And he started trying to talk to me and he, ha he was speaking a different language. And I was thinking, okay, this is crazy. He's speaking local Indian dialect and I'm only speaking English, like, so he must be from here. And so I started to do research 
uh, to figure out how this guy was in India. And I realized that he was a part of this small tribe called the Sidi people. And now at that time, there wasn't much information on the Sidi people. So I had like little to no information about where they were really located, you know, how I would I even get there? Who would I even talk to? Because we don't even speak the same languages. And after I started doing research, I found people and I made it happen. And so when I got to the village, I asked them, like, where have you been? How, why is it so hard for people to find you? And they told me that um, they used to, growing up, when they'd see somebody else coming to their coming to their house, they would run into the woods and they would hide. So this is like, I wanna say in the 80s and the 90s, they would just hide, they would run and hide. So you wouldn't know that they were living there or that they were there. They didn't want people to see them because they were afraid that if anybody saw them, that they would get captured and they would become a slave again. And so it's heavily influenced um, their lifestyle in, I guess, their community. They're very close knit, tight knit people. It's not always easy getting access into their community because I think that because of slavery, they're just very hesitant to let other people in. So it's, it's greatly impacted who they are as a people. Wow, okay. Um, two, Keisha and, and Kayla have both asked, how long have you been doing photography? Aww. Um, so I've been doing photography for about six years. So when I was about 22, well, today's my birthday actually. So I turned 29 today. Um, so yeah, it's been about six, seven years. Okay. Wow. Um, I feel like you've accomplished so much in six or seven years and happy birthday. Well, We'll have to do something about that before this session is over. Um, I'm going to go back to Tiger and August. Do you have a question you'd like to ask, or should we go back to the chat bar? Guys, just let me know. Um, we got a question. Um, do the CD have, like the children, do they have any type of uh, schooling? Yeah, they do. So actually one of the issues that they were having in the CD tribe was that a lot of the kids were being bullied because of, you know, their hair, which is like, you know, African, they have like a little Afro. They were getting bullied at school. And so one of the reasons why they started the cultural programs was to help with the bullying and making sure that people had basic respect for themselves. And um, it was more so like their resilience tool. So they were having a problem with kids dropping out of school because they didn't want to go because they were getting bullied. So they started after school tutoring programs as well for them. So they go to a school and then after school, they have a community program where they can go and get help with their homework and have cultural events. Do you have a question? That's great. Um, well, one, Asha, the chat bar is blowing up with happy birthday messages. I'm really excited you chose to spend your birthday with us. Of course. Uh, and lots of birthday cake emojis. Um, but uh, one question that I think is a fun question is what do you do outside of work? What do you do besides photography? But I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I explore. I like to go hiking. I like to go camping. I like to spend time with my family. Hopefully my nieces and nephews, Kayla, Parker, and Riley are watching this because I gave them a link and you better. <laughs> um, but those are the things that I like to do. I like to spend time with my family and friends and hike and travel. And I'm very fortunate that through photography and filmmaking, which started as a hobby, is actually my job now. So that's wonderful. Um, I think you kind of already answered the first piece of this, but um, as we get close to the end of our time here, one thing we always like to ask our explorers is one, how can young people get involved in your work or the kinds of projects that you undertake um, at home? And that's especially important now. What's, what are things that um, we could all learn about at home that impact your work? Yeah, I think just being curious about 
what's happening in your own town, whether it be environmental issues like climate change or sea level rise, or you know how local people who may not have the same resources as you are impacted. Um, I'm always doing stuff with National Geographic Education. So tell your teachers to get in contact with me and I can work with them on any of the projects that I'm doing in the, in the future. So um, whenever this virus ends, I'll actually be doing another National Geographic expedition across the Southern United States. So there's always ways to get involved um, with me through your teachers as well. And then following and things like that. Okay, great. And then I think a more sort of broad question for all of the young explorers who are watching today. Um, what advice do you have to share with young people and students as they figure out what their what their passion is in life? I think just go for it. If it's something that you're interested in, just do it. Like I just picked up this camera and I just started documenting any and everything that I, I thought was um, important to me. And so I think that uh, you can use a smartphone, you can use your parent's phone, you can just start taking portraits right now during quarantine time of what's happening in your life because we're all living in this historical moment. And I think that at any point in time, you can, if you're interested in the visual form, you can just start documenting from your perspective right now. And don't be afraid to use your voice. If, if something you know, really resonates with you, whether it's climate change or animals or you know, people, and then I think you should go for it. I think you should stand up for the things that you believe in. And I think that you should um, figure out what way you would like to convey that. Okay. That is wonderful advice. Um, we're coming up right on the end of our time here. So I wanna go ahead and remind everyone that um, Explorer Classroom is live every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We have tons of incredible explorers for you all to meet and learn from. Um, so come back tomorrow or come back next week, come back whenever you have the time. Um, before we leave though, especially because it's Asha's birthday, I'm going to go ahead and switch the view so you can see all of us and I'm going to unmute all our mics and we're going to say happy birthday really loud and then we're going to say goodbye and then we'll be done for the day. But I've loved spending time with you and Asha, I just want to thank you so much. I've learned a lot. Um, thank you for sharing your time and your birthday with us. So with that, um, where should all be unmuted? Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you guys. And goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.